speaker who is literally an expert in complexity. The C this CEO is considered one of the world's brightest minds in complexity science. He's co-founder of LifeNome, a precision health and wellness platform that uses artificial intelligence to leverage biological, physiological, lifestyle, and behavioral data to provide highly personalized preventative healthcare. He's literally redefining the phrase precision healthcare. And while that sounds like science fiction, it's actually science fact. Please welcome Dr. Ali Mustashari, CEO of LifeNome. Ali? Um, hi, thank you so much, Lee, for having me. Um, actually, I think the term precision was, prevent, was invented way before um, I started my work in precision, and I'm definitely not redefining it. I'm just engaging in it together with our team um, of scientists. Um, really enjoyed David's uh, talk, a lot of uh, overlap there. Um, would like to take that time to just um, more than just uh, kind of talking about what we do at LifeNome, I would like to kind of provide what's happening on uh, the scale with regards to precision health and what you can expect um, to see in the next um, couple of years, not that far down. And the way we um, I just want to kind of distinguish the concept of precision health from precision medicine. So precision health is a step before precision medicine. This is when people are not yet um, in any way um, experiencing a pathology. So there is no disease yet. So the, the average person who might not be living the most perfect lifestyle, but is generally healthy or dealing with some um, basic levels of issues such as like overweight or obesity, uh, things like that, but not necessarily, um, it's not about treating disease, it's about how to stay healthy. Um, and here's basically, if you look at this particular slide, this kind of summarizes what precision health generally is. It's the ability to take data, such as biological data, and that includes the DNA, microbiome, uh, your RNA sequence, your uh, proteomics data, your physiological data from your wearables, from images, from MRIs, uh, other devices, behavioral data such as lifestyle, psychometrics, preferences and culture, demographics in terms of age, gender, phase of life, all of these data layers and spatial temporal, what time of the day, where are you located, all of that plays into um, providing the optimal decision personalized for an individual. And that's what we call either hyper-personalization or precision in terms of the assessment side. And the goal of that is really with regards to health is really two things. And it kind of plays into what David was discussing, uh, two aspects, which he probably, in, in addition to longevity, he's also focused a lot on vitality, looking at how look good he looks. Um, the, uh, longevity is how long we live, vitality, is how well, what the quality of that life is. And that includes both the physical and the psychological aspects um, of how we feel, how we feel the quality of life that we're experiencing. Um, and the personalization that can happen for a particular person, given the data that, uh, that we have on the left-hand side, can impact the person's nutrition and diet, their fitness, uh, even their choice of beauty and personal care products, um, the phase of life things such as pregnancy and parenting, preventing preventative health and aging, and of course, cognitive and mental health. Um, so generally, LifeNome is um, engaged in many of these areas with enterprise partners who are trying to um, actually take the science forward. Uh, we are on the translational side of science. Um, so the, uh, what you can see in here, um, I will basically discuss each of these aspects of what you can expect in the next couple of years. And where we are with the science, how good it is, it doesn't mean that every company on the market has that level of science, but actually it means what is the level of science or, or evidence that we can base our decisions on so far. And these, of course, will change uh, over time. So um, we go from a, a state of the science being either still science fiction to some fair evidence, which is basically when there's just a bunch of studies and they don't really um, they're not cohesive together, they don't paint a bigger picture, to meaningful evidence, to solid evidence. Um, and with regards to precision, we're primarily right now at a place where we can now do meaningful evidence. Um, the um, things that we can personalize uh, a person's nutrition on include how that person processes vitamins and minerals, their metabolism, their unique optimal diet, and how they should lose weight, 
any food sensitivities, allergies that they, they might have that they might be aware of or not aware of, um, flavor and taste perception, food ingredient interactions with their biology, whether their particular genes uh, would impact them in one way or another, and the effectiveness of different kinds of functional food on that person. So uh, it's not that every single functional food is impactful on the same person. And where you will see that soon as in food retailers, you go to a grocery store, basically aisle seven, it tells you this is the best product for you. Um, at the restaurant, uh, you can basically look at the menu and an and, uh, and AI system or an application can tell you based on your um, personalized information, which meals are the best, or you can optimize your meal delivery, um, personalize your supplements. Again, supplement space, as uh, David said, is not regulated. What's very important is to ensure that you don't get too much of, not 400% of everything. Um, and then um, the packaged foods, uh, just choosing the ones that are uh, packaged foods generally are not necessarily on the healthiest side, but uh, choosing the ones that are healthier. And again, the choice of functional foods. In terms of fitness, um, a lot of um, advances have been made actually in recent years. A lot of uh, both academic institutions and companies working on how um, to fit personalize fitness. And we basically look at how a person's physiological response, and we get that a lot of times through wearable data or fitness benefits on health outcomes. Not everyone who works out will get a reduction in their blood pressure, a reduction in the heartbeat. Uh, so uh, we have to understand different needs of people. An individual's muscle structure, um, the, what they started out with is actually quite important in terms of whether that person will be um, able to uh, work on their muscles in one way or another. And of course, that uh, also leads us into understanding uh, injury potentials. Um, and also the, a person's ability, whether the a person has the, um, uh, the body that's necessary to be a great athlete, a lot of times that has to do with genetics. Here, the evidence is a little bit less uh, solid than it is for foods, um, but it's getting there. So I'm expecting that within the next two, three years that we get to meaningful evidence there. Um, you could see uh, personalized choices in skincare and hair care products very, very soon uh, coming out into the market. And part of that is we now have a lot of pretty good data to get started on this, of course. Um, a lot of new data has to come out, which is not possible to do through clinical trials. So it has to really be commercial rollouts that then um, are able to, through the feedback to, from um, the end customers, be able to improve the science. Uh, but what we can tell is what are some of the person's skincare characteristics that, are, that differ from person to person? What kind of ingredients work best for a particular uh, person and which ones, which active ingredients are better absorbed, which ones uh, require lower dosage or higher dosage. So all of those things are things that we now have a much better handle on uh, to be able to personalize every single individual uh, skincare product for a particular person, both in terms of topical, but also ingestibles. Um, the science there uh, with regards to uh, the beauty side is again, somewhere between fair and meaningful. It's still a good starting point right now, as far as we're very clear to the end customers, what the state of the science is and what they can expect. So basically what we always tell um, end users is here's the state of the science, the way it is today, you can actually help us improve on that as an industry. Um, the next part is actually some things such as phase specific uh, personalized care, and that's, for example, pregnancy and parenting. Um, it is pretty important uh, uh, what kind of food a mom eats has a huge impact on the out health outcomes of a child um, for years, years to come. That's both in terms of gut microbacteria with regards to genetics, uh, the, the impact of genetics and the gut microbacteria are critical there. Um, but also understanding what kind of impacts particular functional foods may have on uh, the health outcomes of the mother and the child, we know a lot more about. And right now, this is an area that uh, we're, we're, for example, launching a, um, a platform called Nine Moons that uh, focuses primarily on personalized pregnancy nutrition uh, based on the best available science and the, um, and the individuals uh, uh, who have designed this program are among uh, are the top cited scholars in the world in uh, maternal health with more than 80,000 citations. Um, so this is, there's again, more meaningful evidence in this area, understanding um, how uh, the relationship between food and nutrition and um, particular health outcomes 
is something that we're very much interested in. Um, in terms of what you can expect with regards to some of the things that um, David was talking about, the issue of preventative health and aging, again, so getting a sense, uh, synapses based on different kinds of tests of who, what kind of responses you will be having, uh, things such as uh, blood, uh, continuous glucose monitoring, things such as uh, the genetics of being predisposed to something, the epigenetics of the, ch the changes that we see within a particular, within a generation and across a generation uh, with regards to uh, responses to uh, insulin resistance and other areas. Um, the issue of pre-screening for diseases, again, impact of functional foods and boosting the immune system to mitochondrial. Uh, the mitochondrial DNA is actually quite interesting and impacting that is gonna be quite important. So the mitochondria, is the source of a lot of our immune system responses. Uh, so it's pretty important to pay attention to the health of the mitochondria as well. The state of the science here is actually relatively much better advanced. And the reason for that is it's closer to the medical side and there's been a lot more clinical studies that have been done that help us do uh, connect a person's personalized characteristics to their health outcomes and to the intervention outcomes. In terms of mental or cognitive health, um, actually there's a lot of good research uh, that is emerging right now. The, the field is really not yet there, but within a couple of years, understanding what are the, what comes easy to a person, what comes easy to a child, what comes easy to a person in terms of uh, careers, what kind of careers might be best for a person. Instead of looking at what kind of careers are available, there are ways to look at um, how a personalized, um, the personalized characteristics of a person can impact their learning over time and their career choice over time. This can also, in, in the longer term, you might have seen these science fiction uh, kind of series on TV called One. It's about matchmaking uh, two people that are in some ways uh, genetically or in other ways compatible. Uh, we're not there yet, but there's, um, there is evidence to suggest that we are attracted specifically to particular types, at least at the beginning. So in terms of, what it, the, in terms of the physical attraction, there is some levels of um, predictability that has to do with understanding a person's characteristics and who they might be attracted to. And so instead of maybe swiping right and left, you get a lot more uh, personalized choices that you see in, uh, you will probably be seeing in dating apps. But again, that's more closer right now to science fiction with some evidence, but not really significant evidence um, uh, that we will be having. So all of, all of these together, if you think about it, uh, creates um, critical ethical considerations, right? So we have the issue of, there's a bunch of issues that are important. If we are actually able to understand a person's characteristics, then the question becomes, together with new technologies such as CRISPR, will we arrive at a world, uh, the world of the brave new world or Gattaca, if you've seen the movie, will we have that issue of um, what will happen if people are now able with some level of knowledge to make decisions on what kind of ch children to have or not to have. So for example, in our company five years ago, we were asked by an IVF company whether we could provide test different um, fertilized eggs to allow the parent to choose which one should be uh, inserted first. And that's an ethic, so we of course refuse, but that's something that might happen at some point once we get into this slippery slope of a personalized understanding of a person's nature. And the problem with that is if, if a person has a gene for, let's say, a, a schizophrenia, what we will do is um, we might eliminate that person, but then we will have no more Van Goghs or no more uh, Picassos in the world because those people are not normative people. So basically, this is the uh, this is a huge dilemma. Regulation is needed there, and understanding of the public is definitely needed there in terms of how to deal with this. There's an issue also with regards to comes down to both. I'm pretty sure David has thought about it with regards to accessibility. If we have all these technologies, are they going to be accessible to everyone? Are they going to be just limited to some people in terms of access? We need to really think about that. And is there any time, at any time something that might really kind of result in some sort of discrimination? Uh, so this is for us uh, a very, very important area. And I will finally close by saying one of the things that people don't understand about science that well, and we science, on the science side, we need to be very, very careful about how, um, how, how, how much certain do we project in what we say. So when we say 
we are able to do this, people really need to understand the limitations of that. In the peer review process within academia, we understand the claims, the narrowness of them, the limitations of them. But when, we, uh, when, when scientists enter business, then the question is, how do they then respond to not giving people false hope, not telling people things that are still uncertain? And the uns there's always uncertainty in science. There's no absolutely no area in science that has zero uncertainty. So how do we communicate that uncertainty in a, um, in a meaningful way? Um, and then the last question that arises on the ethical side is the value of information of individuals. So if individuals are providing their personalized information in order for um, for people to make profits on the business side, then the question is, are the individuals in some ways um, going to be participating in the value uh, that they've created? Are they part of the value chain? So these are the kinds of things that I wanted to bring to attention everyone. So for, uh, for that thought process to be uh, completed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ali. I have a couple of questions. You know, we're seeing right now with just the internet, how far behind the, the regulatory spectrum is and how difficult it is to manage. I mean, what you and David Sinclair are proposing is gonna be a Pandora's box, you know, that it just seems that, that the government's gonna have no way of, of keeping pace with, with the science. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's definitely true. Uh, it's gonna get worse. Um, as we, the, the, the implications of, so you can try to regulate individual, individual areas of research, but when they also synergize together and interact together, so CRISPR is a separate development, precision health is a separate development, you combine them together, now the complexity kind of arises like significantly, right? It's a totally different area. So what, for example, the European Union did is they did restrict, extremely restrictive regulatory approaches like from many, many years ago, and that actually stopped science dead in track. So you have right. that balance of if you do too much regulation, you're stopping the science. If you do too little regulation, um, you're going to basically have um, issues there. Um, there is some responsibility on behalf of the people who are developing these technologies, not just to be technologists, but actually think of societal issues. And I think something I will say from my side, um, having been around technical people and scientists most of the time, is we rarely think about that. It's We get really, really, really enthusiastic about what we're able to accomplish. We get really um, excited about what, what's possible. And uh, we're like, oh, someone else is taking care of the ethical side. I'm not an ethicist. But what's interesting is, first of all, nobody else understands the can understand the implications a social scientist may not know what the implications are in order to then start thinking about them. Definitely a regulatory person looking at the state of this country's politics, I'm pretty sure nobody really in the political parties understands anything about uh, what, what these uh, technology and technological advances mean. So basically, unfortunately, this is our, we need to do, be a first line of defense against our own potential damage that we may cause to advancing that technology, and I, I think this is a this is this is our mandate, and to post to kind of try to uh, project it onto others is unfair. Well, it's interesting because we've seen this happen already. You know, back in the early days of stem cell research, which was completely pushed off. You know, the the North American continent because of of regulatory you know issues. So you know, the, the government can certainly put a clamp down on on science, but you know, just as you're saying, it, you know, it, it may be up to the scientists themselves to provide the ethics. You've already got people coming asking <laughs> you to, you know, be making decisions about about potential human beings. Yeah. You know, pre, you know, Absolutely. pre insemination. The the only thing is the only thing is, for example, putting the if if we put the onus on a uh, David Sinclair or on an Ali Masashari, that's not fair. Also, because we are individuals, so what really needs to happen is instead of us thinking, oh, I I have this technology, I'm going to go forward, someone else will take care of it, is the understanding that we're all contributing to a, a fundamental paradigm shift in the way humans are living. Let's create associations that then those associations, those networks can then to get, come together and create industry standards for what needs to be happening in terms of looking at social determinants of health, in terms of looking at um, what the implications are. 
and managing ourselves uh, in, in the sense that we, we adhere to those. And if we do that, then the government doesn't come and clamp down. Government comes and clamps down when they can't control, something's out of control. But the, if the industry actually comes and says, here's our proactive uh, approach to creating ethical standards and what we will or will not do, uh, then the government has more leeway of being more flexible and trusting and supporting that industry standard. Right. Well, seeing as the government can't even you know, decide on whether it's worth fixing bridges, you know, and, and fixing past infrastructure, it's hard to imagine them getting their arms around what looks to become a new infrastructure of science. I mean, you guys are, are so far ahead of the curve. And I just have one last question. I had never heard of complexity science. How do you get involved in so many issues that have dovetailed together. It's fascinating. Right, so complexity science is an area that uh, the Santa Fe Institute was one of the first institutes in the nation to look at that. It basically, um, so science in general is about analysis and that means taking something and kind of, kind of get into the different pieces and then understanding it. In complexity science, we say if you cut an elephant into 17 pieces, you don't have 17 elephants, you have a, you know, you have a chopped up elephant. So what really needs to happen is to look at some of the things holistically, which is actually goes against the grain of scientists, which is the analysis instead of synthesis. And so complexity science came about and uh, MIT is pretty strong in it. That's where I got my PhD and that's where my scholarship lies. Um, I'm primarily um, I'm, I have more than 120 papers focused on that particular area of, um, of life and it impacts all aspects in terms of biological organisms interacting in, in terms of uh, um, uh, social systems, technological systems. It's an important area, I think, of study as one of many. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating. Ali, thank you so much for your time.